so one thing that you pick up if you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels and look at the life of Jesus, is that, well, Jesus had a reputation. And it was a reputation that spread because of who he was, because of the things he said, because of the things he did. And specifically, one thing we see about Jesus's reputation is that it was a reputation that drew curious sinners in. It seemed like everywhere Jesus went, that he was invited to dinner at houses, that sinners would come to him, that crowds would flock, and, and that he would teach. And the truth is that as these sinners uh, drew into Jesus and he talked with them and engaged with them and ate with them, uh, it caused some complaining. It caused some grumbling among the religious elite of the day who had a very hard time with Jesus as a rabbi who would welcome and eat with sinners. And that's really the context of Luke chapter 15, where we find the story of the prodigal son that we've been walking through in this series. Uh, Jesus is telling the Pharisees and the scribes uh, a story, really three stories, to help them understand his heart for lostness. This story, this, this chapter, is really all about lostness. A lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons. And what you see in those stories, what Jesus was really trying to communicate is that Jesus came to earth to us because he had a heart for those who were lost. Matter of fact, in just a few chapters later uh, in Luke's gospel, Jesus is going to say very clearly that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so what we need to learn from this story in particular, the story of the prodigal son that we've been talking about, is that lostness looks different for different people, right? That, that it's not just one lost son, a prodigal son. It's a story of two lost sons, the older brother and the younger brother. And, and what we've seen so far in the two weeks that we've been in this series, we've seen, honestly, I think most of us already knew, what lostness looks like in sinners, in those younger brothers, those who have strayed away, those who have chased fleshly desires, those who are far from God. But today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at what lostness looks like in good people, what lossless looks, lostness looks like in very religious people who we see in this story as represented by the older brother. And I know it may seem weird at first to talk about lostness in sinners and in good people, to talk about lostness in the irreligious and the religious. But I think that when you look at this story, we see it because both the younger brother and the older brother have their own way of running away from the father. Uh, this is how author and pastor Tim Keller describes it. He says, Jesus uses the younger and elder brothers to portray the two basic ways that people try to find happiness and fulfillment, the way of moral conformity and the way of self-discovery. Each acts as a lens coloring how you see all of life or as a paradigm shaping your understanding of everything. Each is a way of finding personal significance and worth, of addressing the ills of the world, and of determining right from wrong. So I think Keller does a good job of saying, look, there are older and younger brothers all among us. Those who are after autonomy and self-discovery and desire and pleasure, and those who are after moral conformity and will see control. See, younger brothers use rebellion and immorality to get what they want from life and ultimately from the father. But the older brothers use morality and obedience to get what they want from the father and ultimately from life. And I think we're going to see that here in this story as we really narrow the focus to end this series on the lost older brother. So if you got your Bibles open to Luke 15, read with me if you would. Uh, the last part of this amazing story, starting in verse 25, where the older brother enters back into the picture. We read in verse 25, it says, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother's here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he's back to him safe and sound. And then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. 
But he replied to his father, look, I've been slaving many years for you and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you gave me, you never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who's devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Son, he said to him, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So this story ends in rather dramatic fashion. The son who had liquidated his share of the estate, lived it up, lost it all, and come broken back home, who was received warmly by the father such that he received a robe, a ring, sandals, and a party, is now confronted by an older brother who wants nothing to do with him. An older brother who's angry at what the father has done. An older brother who is bitter because of what the younger son has now received. An older brother who has just pointedly refused to take part in the party. So what I want to do as we kind of wind down the series is really look in at some specific characteristics of the older brother that I think are true of older brothers all among us. Those of us who maybe look more like him than that young prodigal and full transparency, I think that I find myself drawn more to the character of the older brother because I see more of myself sometimes in him. Well, I think the first thing that I want you to see here about the older brother is that he was far from the father, even though he had never left home. What I mean is this, while the younger brother cashed out his share of the estate, He ran as far away from the family farm as possible to find his freedom to fulfill his desires. While all that was going on, this older brother stayed at home, kept working the fields, slept in his bed every night. However, even though this older brother may have never spent a night away from the family farm, it's very clear that his heart was just as far away from the father as his brother's. I think when you begin to understand the similarities between the two brothers' motivations, you can see that their differences in how they accomplished it don't really matter. What I mean is this, is that the hearts of these two brothers were were very similar. Both of these brothers resented the father's authority and control over their life, and both of them started looking for ways to get out from under it. They each wanted to be in their own position of power, their own position of control, their own position of authority, so that they could tell the father what to do. So each one really, in in very real ways, rebelled against the authority of the father in their life. Now, the way they did that was different. The younger brother did that by being very bad and running away from home. But the older brother rebelled by being very good and obedient and never leaving home. Both were far from his heart and both were lost. So I think we need to understand what Jesus is saying. Again, this is Pastor Keller. He says, do you realize then what Jesus is teaching? Neither son loved the father for himself. They were both using the Father for their own self-centered ends rather than loving, enjoying, and serving Him for His own sake. He goes on to say, this means that you can rebel against God and be alienated from Him either by breaking the rules or by keeping them all diligently. Now, that, that fact, that ought to rock our world. The idea that there are many people in church today living good, moral lives, but they're doing so not out of a true love for the Father, but out of a desire to control the Father and to milk Him for His blessings, which ultimately are all they really care about. They use their obedience to try to control the Father. And it's that that is the next marker of the older brother. It's that sense of entitlement and earning through obedience. I mean, when we read the story carefully, it's right there in the story for us, isn't it? When the father comes out of the party to plead with the older brother to go back in, the older brother flat out refuses, and he gives the reason why. He he tells the father, look, I'm not going in. Why? Because I've never disobeyed you. I'm not going to go celebrate with you because I've always done the right thing. 
I'm not going to go and follow your heart to my brother because I haven't done anything wrong. So, so hear me. The older brother is not standing opposed to the father in spite of his goodness. The older brother is standing opposed to the father because of it. It is his goodness that he is using to rebel against his father. How's that even possible? It's because he thought that because of his obedience, he had earned and was entitled to whatever he wanted his dad to give him. And now he found himself offended because the father was giving his brother freely what he thought he had earned. This brother who had squandered family money on prostitutes was now being given a robe, a ring, sandals, and a fattened calf. And the older brother says, he's given that freely. He never earned it. I worked for it. I earned it. It should be mine. Why is he so angry? Because he feels like, hey, I'm the one who should decide who gets the robe. I'm the one who should decide who wears the ring. I'm the one that we should be throwing this party for. Not him. And I think in the same way, religious people live very moral lives. The goal of that life, the goal of doing the right things, the goal of their morality is to get leverage on God, to control him, to put God in a position where he owes them something because they've been so good. And so if you, like this elder brother, like religious people, believe that God owes you something, because you've worked so hard for him, that because you've been so obedient, God has to bless you. The truth is, Jesus isn't your savior. You're your own savior. Jesus is just a machine who is commanded to reflexively respond to your obedience, but it's your action, your will, your work, your effort that ultimately earns what you get from God. See, older brothers obey God to get what they want from God. But what they want from God isn't God himself. It's not to be like him. It's not to know him. It's not to love him. It's not to take their delight in him. They just want blessings from him. God, uh, help me on this test. God, give me a raise. God, fix my marriage. God, heal me of this disease. They don't want God. They just want stuff from God. And here's what I've seen in my own life. When their obedience doesn't get them what they want, they usually get angry. And sometimes that anger is turned toward God, but more often than that, it's turned toward other people. Why is that? Because an elder brother, an older brother's self-image and self-work is all tied up in how hardworking and moral they are, how much of a good person they are, how righteous they are, the feeling that they are the cream of society's crop. And that self-image built on those things inevitably leads to this superior feeling over other people that they don't see as on their level. Out that uh, competitive comparison, he says, is the way elder brothers achieve a sense of their own significance. Well, Pastor Chip, I know I'm not perfect, but... And then we look down our nose at someone else. And I think that that particular dynamic really just kicks into overdrive when we pride ourselves above all else on our right religion, that we do the right things, say the right things, worship the right way, keep all of the commandments, and then we look down from our holy tower on those who don't, and then we blame our hostility towards those people on the fact that they're enemies of God, I'm fighting for righteousness. It becomes easy to justify hate in the name of truth. And When we have that sense of self-worth in self-righteousness, we don't see ourselves as lost. And because of that, when things don't go our way, when we feel like we've done everything right, but the world goes wrong, we become very bitter. And then it even becomes impossible for us to love others to forgive others who seemingly have everything going right 
because we feel like we deserve what they've gotten. We feel superior to them. You can't you can't truly forgive, love, and serve someone that you feel superior to. But here's the good news. The Father extends grace to older brothers too. Now, we might miss this in our culture, but those that Jesus was teaching certainly didn't. It was a clear act of disrespect, of disgrace, and of open hostility when the older son refuses to come in to the no-doubt community-wide party that his father was throwing. When he stubbornly stands outside, tells the servant, go tell my dad I'm not coming in, that brings shame and dishonor on his father. And yet, here's the father who showed the same grace to the younger brother, running to meet him while he was still a young, young, long way off, the father leaves the party and comes out to this bitter older son. And he literally, the text says, pleads with him to come into the party. He's showing him the same grace and mercy that he showed the prodigal. And I think this is where it's important for us to remember that though the characters in this story, the characters in this parable are fictional, they're made up by Jesus to tell this fictional story. The people that are standing around Jesus listening to him tell this story, they were very real. And so what Jesus was doing here, Jesus was appealing to the same people who would in due time plot and scheme to see him crucified on a Roman cross. He was appealing to them to set aside their pride and their self-righteousness to see the Father's heart and to come to him. This was Jesus going outside to the Pharisees and saying, you're just as lost as these sinners, but I love you too. However, at the end of the story, the bad son, the one who spent all his money on prostitutes, is the one inside the father's house. And the good obedient son is the one who is on the outside looking in. You know, I think what makes this amazing story so captivating and so radical is that it, confuse, it refuses to bow down and to conform to the ideas of either the younger or older brothers. It refuses to bow down and, and bend to the irreligious or to the religious. In fact, this story condemns both and compels both. Again, Pastor Keller, this means that Jesus' message, which is the gospel, is a completely different spirituality. The gospel of Jesus is not religion or irreligion. It's not morality or immorality. It's not moralism or relativism. It's not conservatism or liberalism. Nor is it something halfway along the spectrum between two poles. It is something else altogether. The gospel is distinct from the other two approaches. In its view, hear this, everyone is wrong, everyone is loved, and everyone is called to recognize this and change. That's the message of the gospel. Younger sons in their irreligion and rebellion are lost and compelled to come home. Older brothers who are religious and self-righteous are compelled to come home. That's what makes this story such an amazing reflection of the gospel. But up to this point, in the series, we've looked at everything that's in this story. But I want to make sure we end this series by seeing the one character that's not. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, if it's not in the story, how do you know it's missing from the story? If there's a character that's missing, how, how would you even know? Well, we know it's missing because this story is just one in a set of three. Remember? In the stories of the sheep, the coin, and the sons, in all three stories, something goes missing. In all three stories, that is found. And in all three stories, there's a celebration. But one difference is in the first two stories, when the sheep is lost, the shepherd goes looking. When the coin is lost, the one goes looking. But when this story comes of two sons, when the younger brother leaves home, no one goes looking for him. And I think this is even more glaring 
when you realize that this role in Jewish culture to go looking for the younger brother would have fallen to the older brother. You see, the elder brothers were there to reconcile differences between father and younger brothers. And in the context of these three stories told together at the same time in the same place to the same people, Jesus' audience would have almost certainly expected the older brother to be the one to go and bring his wayward brother home. And yet he doesn't. We see that he does the opposite. But here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to see. That Jesus is the better older brother who isn't in the story. He's the one that left the father's house to bring all who were lost back home. He's the one who came looking for us when none of us were looking for him. And he did it at his own costly expense. You know, in this story, part of the reason the older brother is so ticked off with the father's decision, with the younger brother being welcomed back into the family, is that because of that, this older brother just lost even more of his own share in the estate. When the father looks at him and tells him, son, all that I have is yours, he's being very literal. The younger brother had taken his share of the estate so that everything that was left, it was the older brother's inheritance. And so when the father throws the party, it's the older brother who's really paying for it. When the younger brother gets his piece of the pie again, it comes from the older brother's slice. And I think that we can't miss that connection to Jesus because when Jesus brought us, you and I, back into the Father's house, it was costly. He didn't just wave a magic wand and make our sins disappear, but to forgive us our sin, to make us sons and daughters of the Father, it cost his very blood and his very life. And yet, Jesus laid that down for us in all joy. We are brought into the family at a great cost, but a cost that was paid for us, not a cost that was paid by us. Jesus, in reality, is the true and better older brother that was missing from this story. And so now I want to end the series by urging you to take some time to reflect on where you are and maybe even who you are. Maybe you're a younger brother who's lost, who's wandered away, chasing your desires of the flesh, living it up, finding your freedom and self-discovery. Maybe you're an older brother who's lost, bitter and resentful the way that you see the world turning, wishing more people would be like you and feeling like you have earned something out of your goodness and obedience. And when you're honest with yourself, there's a little bit of bitterness in your heart towards God because he hasn't given you what you truly deserve. Whether you're the older brother who's lost or the younger brother who's lost, the invitation to you is very simply, come home. The Father is ready and willing to receive you both. Or maybe you're the child that's already been brought back. I would say to you, let's follow the Father's heart to those who are still far from home, to those who are wayward and astray in their sins, and those who are bitter and hard in their self-righteousness. Let's follow the Father's heart to the lost like our truer older brother did for us. And then, as God continues to show mercy and grace to lost sinners who come home, let's celebrate and rejoice in the goodness of our Father. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for the time that you've given us in this amazing little story. I pray that through it we would see the gospel clearly, that we would see ourselves in where we are as younger brothers, as older brothers, whatever, and that if we are still lost, that you would call us home run, meet us, and bring us back to you. And that if we've already been brought back home, that we would follow your heart to those who haven't. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.